scripture verse in the 119th Psalm, verse 160, it says, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. So there you have the inspiration. And by the way, spira means breath. So anything that is inspired was God breathed or he, he breathed his brains came up about inspiration. But the question is, how much of the breath of God is there in that book? And I believe that the breath of God very well permeates this book. Therefore, if you want to say in English it's inspired, and the Latin would say in breathed, and uh, the Greek would say that it is blown along or carried along as with a wind, you see, and uh, remember Jesus' uh, conversation with Nicodemus, the wind bloweth where it listeth. In other words, it blows where it wants to. And God blows where he wants to. And thou hearest the sound thereof, and you can't tell where it's coming from, and you can't tell where it's going. But if he blows it, he knows. And you know, uh, it's very interesting what God can do. Uh, it's even possible for God to save a sinner to be sitting in a place where uh, a modernist is talking about bunk. And God can still save him if, if he's of a mind to him. The Holy Spirit's there. I was, as a student, I was sent to, a, uh, to look at other churches other than ours, and one of the places I was sent to go was a modernistic, very liberal. And the preacher there was, uh, he was a modernist. And he spent the whole time uh, on the subject of there is a God. <clears throat> but nearly everything he said, uh, it seemed to me, he showed that uh, as far as he was concerned, there was no God, but his subject was, there is a God. That's tremendous, isn't it? And uh, on the way out, there weren't a lot of people in the church. It would have, it would have holded a hundred, hundred more, a hundred times as many as were in it. But uh, I happened to be right behind a dear little old lady, a habitual church goer, uh, who was there, and I was right behind her. To I wanted to get out without shaking hands with the pastor, but I, it was what, not my luck. He was there by the door, and it was I didn't see any other. And she was right ahead of me, and she shook hands with him, and she looked up into his face, and she said, Pastor, I have to tell you that no matter what you say, I still believe in God. <laughs> And so I did escape because he hadn't overcome that when I got by. <laughs> I didn't have to say anything to him. But that's just about the tenor of the whole thing. You see, but God, it was the breath of God that's breathed into the book. And the portion of the breath of God that's in the book, it's just going to come out and it's going to convict sinners and it's going to do his work and, and, and his will. And if we don't get in the way, it'll be in God's way. Now, you have a subject that's given to you on this program, and uh, I apologize. I'm not going to deal with that subject. It's very technical. Uh, I need about three hours instead of 35 minutes. I don't have 35 minutes anymore because of the way the program is moving. Uh, I couldn't any more. I couldn't do any more than to just stir up your, what should I say, dishonest doubts about that subject. So what I want to do is something that maybe I hope. I pray, more practical, more valuable to you. And if it isn't, why, uh, you get up and go to one of the other sessions and you won't offend me a bit because if there's nobody left here, why, well, I'll just stop talking. Uh, but uh, the first thing that I want to bring to your attention is the fact that in many, many American homes and even in the libraries of our churches, there are copies of the set called the Book of Life. You, ever, you know what the Book of Life is? You don't. The Book of Life, a, a bunch of uh, uh, encyclopedias that people are sold and uh, taught 
will be good to help to raise your children and all that sort of thing, the Book of Life? How many never heard of the Book of Life? Much hard to believe. Well, the rest of you, if you didn't hear of it, you did hear of it. If you did hear of it, you didn't buy it, well, you were smart. But in many of the churches and in many of the homes, there's the Book of Life. And I want to say that I have here a picture. I photocopied a few pages out of the Book of Life. Uh, and I, I wrote at the bottom of this that the Book of Life has contributed to the basic American attitude on both Scripture and Apocrypha. These pages tend to lift the perceptions of Jerome's abilities in Hebrew. Jerome was Catholic. Jerome is the, the father of the Vatican, the, the Vaticanus. Uh, the, no, that's not right. The, the, uh, the, what am I trying to say? The Vulgate. Thank you. I got the right first letter. Okay, the Vulgate. Yeah, Jerome's Vulgate. And, uh, both Roman and Orthodox Bibles are also lifted in this, and so is the Septuagint. And I want to bring to your attention that here are a bunch of pages. If I don't tell you what's there, maybe I should. When the church became wholly Gentile, it used the Septuagint exclusively with all its additions to the Hebrew text. See, now that's in your... That's in that... Uh, that book, that set of books. And uh, he, it says that it remained that way until the Reformation, and it is still. Now, the Protestants have usually held that the Apocrypha are religiously valuable. Is that true? Is that genuinely true? That's in the Book of Life, and a lot of our young people have been taught that. It says further, the 39 articles of the Church of England state that they are books which, quote, the Church doth read for example of life and instruction of manners, but yet doth it not apply them to establish any doctrine. And maybe that's all I have outlined, uh, underlined, but I bring to, and if you want to look at this, you may. If you want to borrow it and photocopy it, you may. But the Apocrypha is whitewashed by the Book of Life, and many homes have made the Apocrypha, which teaches prayers for the dead, and uh, uh, penance in purgatory, and of course the existence of purgatory, and that kind of thing that's unbiblical. And I have known Baptist pastors to support their ministries when the, a small church couldn't pay them, They'd go out and work for this company and sell this set of books to the various congregations of the county or all the counties around and make their living that way. And they should have read it instead and found out why they should not spread this kind of heresy. Uh, that's something that I thought ought to be said in a conference like this. And that's a very simple thing. And you don't need to know any of the Hebrew I put on the blackboard a while ago in order to understand that. Now, a lot of people, this is an entirely different subject. This is a bunch of flotsam. A lot of people have the notion that it was not until the late part of the 19th century that anybody began tampering with the Bible. That's not true. I have photocopied, what, two or three pages out of Eusebius's church history. Did you ever hear of Eusebius? Yeah, he was one of the church fathers. Now, the title of his book is The History of the Church from Christ to Constantine. Who knows what date it might have been that he wrote the book? Kind of early, isn't it? What century are you going to place it? Yeah, it's pretty early. Now, these manuscripts that they have recently, like the, the one that Tischendorf, you know, Aleph, and the Vaticanus, and Sinaiticus, these that all the new versions are playing up are dated as 4th century. See? Now, it's 
my idea and the idea of a number of the men, maybe all of them, on the Dean Burgon Executive Committee, that the substance of the changes in those few manuscripts uh, and the reason they disagree among themselves, and of course disagree with the TR and the Masoretic text, is because there was theological turmoil that began to develop prior to the time of Constantine. After all, you know, there was the fight there as to whether Arianism, uh, today we don't call it that, we call it Unitarianism, are we Trinitarian? Do we believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, three in one, all perfect, indivisible, and yet three persons, one Godhead? That's what we believe. But prior to the time of Constantine, they were having a fuss and a fight about that very subject. And there, were, there was a majority. It was understood, and history has recorded, that there was a majority that went along with the idea that this notion that this Jesus of Nazareth was actually God, let's do away with that. He was not God, you see. He was, he was well, he was a son of God, but, uh, and we've had a little bit introduction in one or two of these uh, uh, studies here of existentialism, which says he was becoming God and he's ahead of us, but we can follow in his train, we can become that like that too. Oh yeah, you're never going to catch him. And by the way, my Bible doesn't allow for the existence or the experience of existentialism in Jesus Christ since he is God and he's always been perfect, so how can he become anything? See? <laughs> There's no improvement possible with God. Wouldn't that discourage you? See? Aren't you glad you aren't God? You can't improve? We can improve. We can become like Jesus Christ. However, on these few pages here, and uh, there's a quote at the top of page 237 about uh, a poor man who needs to prostrate himself in tears in front of Bishop Zephrinus. And he had been guilty of one of these heresies, and they almost didn't let him back into the church so he could take the communion. Now remember, this is way before there was a Protestantism and a Romanism. There was just church. Now it's true that the churches weren't all alike. Some of them were much more liturgical and much more what we would say would be either Greek Orthodox or Roman Catholic uh, in their ways. But they didn't have any of those names attached to them. They just called the pastor bishop because he was the pastor. Now, the writer here, and this is Eusebius, one of the church fathers, he says, to this I will add some further comments on, this, on the same perversions from the same writer. Quote, they have not hesitated to corrupt the word of God. That's before the time when those manuscripts that we complain about even were written. See? They have treated the standard of the primitive faith with contempt. They have not known Christ. Instead of asking what Holy Scripture says, they have strained every nerve to find a syllogistic figure. Well, let's not waste a lot of time with that. That's, uh, you either know or you don't know what that is. And uh, it's just something to mess people up with. Uh, a syllogistic figure, I could spend time with uh, Aristotle's syllogisms and his logic and so on, but I'm not going to. A syllogistic figure to bolster up their godless. Yes, I will give you one illustration. You see, if you're going to take a syllogism and you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, Eden, Adam, he was perfect, wasn't he? Did he start out perfect? In fact, some of our theologians say he started out holy. Well, now, I say that I don't say he was holy. I say he was relatively holy because if he had been holy, his, the holiness that he was would have rejected the temptation. So you see, he was not perfectly holy. He had a tendency, we hope, toward holiness. However, 
you take that and add them, let's, let's for just argument's sake, say we'll paste the label on and say Adam was holy. How did he become? Well, he became lost. He became fallen. What happened? Uh, it's true that Eve listened to the serpent, but the real contact with Adam was Eve. So you see, in a syllogism, it has to be that Eve is sin. And so that's how the early Roman church and the early Orthodox church, as they followed that kind of teaching from church fathers, and they, they took a little of the Apostle Paul, but they didn't take all of Paul. They took a little of Peter, but they didn't take enough. Uh, they took the Bible where they wanted to, and the rest of it they objected, and they rejected. And they said, well, man, it would be perfectly all right if it weren't for woman. Woman always gets you to see a woman. The woman always gets the man in trouble. You just watch and see. Well, that's always true. Now, uh, today, we've been preaching the Word of God long enough that we, we know that in actual fact, the, the woman, if she's a right woman, she often gets him out of the trouble and keeps him out of it. See, if she knows the Lord Jesus Christ is her Savior, and if she prays for him. And she certainly, in many, many homes, is it not true that the children grow up to know the Lord Jesus Christ and love him on account of the woman? Lots of times more than on account of the man. That's why we have to preach to some of the men as much as we do. Well, anyway, that's a syllogism. But it is, you know, we have to explain it, and it's not necessarily logical, and it isn't necessarily true. They put aside the sacred word of God and devote themselves to geometry, to earth measurement, because they are from the earth and they speak from the earth and they do not know the one, and that's with a capital O, they do not know the one who comes from above. <laughs> and then he has a little inset here. He says, refer to John 3.31. It's pretty good for an old timer. This, you know, this long ago, that's pretty good preaching. Some of them give all their energies to the study of Euclidean geometry. Uh, let's not bother with that. And treat Aristotle and Theophrastus with reverent awe. To some of them, Galen. In case you don't know who Galen was, he was an MD. He was a physician. See. And, of course, you got to go to him to get some cure. Uh, now, we've, we no longer, in the, in the 19, early 19th century, if you got funny in the head, well, you went to the MD, and he probably gave you a little belladonna or, or one of those other nice little homopathic remedies, and that jolted you a little bit, and you got to think straight again for two or three days until you got another dose of the same thing. You might even get cured. Uh, but... Uh, now we got another kind of a, a fella. He, he gives you uh, pills that don't have anything in them to try to convince you that the pill that didn't have any, you don't know it, doesn't have anything in it. In it. And so you think, you, you think better, and you think improvement, so of course you improve, unless you die of the whole thing. But uh, the thing is to not to come to the preaching of the Word of God to get changed, saved, cured, altered, prepared for heaven, no, that's not the message. The message is uh, something secular that can be handled by the physicians and go to the medics. And uh, I know a preacher who says something that's great, and I say it too because I heard him say it first. And he said, the pastor, the Bible-believing pastor needs to do all of his counseling right from the pulpit to the congregation, and he needs almost no private counseling. There may be certain extreme cases where he needs some private counseling, but none of it should be done in the study when the subject who needs the counseling is lying on a couch. That causes a lot of problems and a great deal of trouble, and if they would do less of that and get up here and preach the word, the Spirit of God has put the cures that the congregations, the people of today need... He's put them all in the Bible. If we faithfully preach the whole counsel of God, they're going to get the cure sooner or later. And I believe that. Now, that's Galen. He's almost an object of worship. And so are the sciences in our times with all the various physicians, with all their various... Chop it all up into little tiny grooves of specializations. They've got the answer. 
When people avail themselves of the arts of unbelievers to lend color to their heretical views and with godless rascality, isn't that an interesting word? With godless rascality corrupt the simple faith of holy writ, it is obvious that they are nowhere near the faith. And he's got faith in capital F. So it was that they laid hands unblushingly on the Holy Scriptures, claiming to have corrected them. You see how long ago that was that they were correcting the Bible? Yeah. He says, in saying this, I'm not slandering them, as anybody who wishes can soon find out. If anyone will take the trouble to collect their several copies and compare them, he will discover frequent divergencies. For example, Aesculapides' copies do not agree with Theodotus's. A large number are, unobtain are, a large number are obtainable thanks to the emulous energy with which disciples copied the quote, emendations, unquote, or rather perversions of the text by their respective masters, nor do these agree with Hermophiles' copies, and as for Apollonius, his cannot be harmonized with each other. He did several of them, and none of them, no one of them agrees with the rest. What's the point? The point is that the enemies of the truth of God had been, had been corrupting the scriptures for a long time. A long time. And uh, it comes right down to the question that Dr. Fuller's put on one of his books, which Bible? And there really is only one correct Bible, and that's the Bible of these two texts, which we speak of, the Masoretic, where we get our Hebrew old, and the Textus the Keptus, or Receptus, as people call it, uh, for the New Testament, the Greek. And then Luther, of course, translated it into German, and we have the KJV 1611, which represents the work of the scholarship of that time, and we still have that in English. Now, of course, there's a lot of the rest of the world, and thank God that they got the Bible somehow. Now, that's the subject. I leave that with you. Here's another one. You heard of Erasmus. Anybody here ever heard anything nice said about Erasmus? You ever heard anything good said about Erasmus? He's one of the bad guys, isn't he? For the most part. All right, now I want to defend Erasmus. Not that I love him a lot. I should love him, you know, in Christ, if he was a Christian. I kind of think he was. He was a Roman Catholic. Uh, usually you're told that he was a Roman Catholic, and of course he was a humanist. So they say, well, he was a humanist. He didn't deny that. But there is a difference between a humanist, now you, you mark carefully, there's a difference between a humanist and a secular humanist. Today we have troubles with secular humanists and secular humanism. They're trying to get us away from the belief in anything except materialism. So, of course, they have no room for any god or gods or religion or any kind of thought of God. Certainly not for a Bible. Erasmus was not that kind of a man. He was not. He was a humanist, which originally meant he was interested in the uplift of humanity. Man was in a mess. Let's get something to help poor man. He's trying to lift himself by his bootstraps. He's never going to make it. If God doesn't help, there is no help at all. Now, that was Erasmus' true belief. But he was a Roman Catholic. If I may read, Erasmus, the Dutchman, was the great interpreter of humanism to his age. Yet he was to some extent devout. I didn't write this. This is in print. He was in, to some extent devout. He published the first printed edition of the Greek New Testament in 1516. Also, an edition of the Latin New Testament. He wasn't quite dumb, you see. He was not real stupid. Uh, the first edition, 
uh, of the Latin New Testament, which Cambridge students waited in line to purchase. At least one student was converted reading that Latin Testament. He was an ordained priest of the Roman Catholic Church, which he criticized but never left. He knew intimately the progress of the Reformation, but he never joined Protestant forces. In addition to translating and editing the New Testament, he put it into paraphrases which were enthusiastically received. I don't know whether we're going to approve of them. You see, he, he was the first paraphraser, maybe, in English. He put them into paraphrases. And in 1548, made a translation of them in English and put in every parish church alongside of the Bible. That's like a tract. He wanted them to have these explanations. Now, how bad was he? Let's go on. Here's a quotation from Erasmus. In fact, I have several quotations. He says, when faith is in the mouth rather than in the heart, when the solid knowledge of sacred scripture fails us, nevertheless, by terrorization, we drive men to believe what they do not believe, to love what they do not love, to know what they do not know. That's wrong. That's Erasmus. He says, that which is forced cannot be sincere, and that which is voluntary cannot please Christ. That's Erasmus. He's a humanist. Again, regarding what the Romans call the sacrament, and he called it the sacrament, or what uh, we Baptists with all capital letters call the Lord's Supper, and then there's some who aren't quite that Baptist, they call it communion. Uh, hope I didn't hurt your feelings. He says, and they had a big fight about what, what, was, what that was on the table. What do you actually get if the priest puts it on your tongue, or if you put it in there yourself, or if the preacher does? What is it? What is it, you see? Now, we Baptists, I think, have united agreement that that is bread and probably grape juice. It better be of the fruit of the vine. Now, we don't argue about that. They had a lot of, they didn't know. This is what he says. He says, no matter what the elements are, to take them will not do you the least good unless you commune with Christ in your heart. Breathes there a Baptist pastor with soul so dead who has not to himself sometimes said, when they receive the Lord's table, I wonder what they're really thinking about. I'm talking from Erasmus. Imagine taking Erasmus as a text. And off. Now, here's something else. Uh, I think I'll skip that one. How much time do I have left? Eight minutes, I better hurry. Okay. Uh, here, here you go. Here's a prayer. This is a prayer of Erasmus. He says, O thou who art the true son of the world. That's S-U-N. He's calling God the S-U-N. He was living in a time where there are lots of people who were bowing down, you know, and the sun had come up, they'd bow down facing the east. O thou who art the true son of the world, ever rising and never going down, who by thy most wholesome appearing and sight dost nourish and gladden all things in heaven and earth, we beseech thee mercifully to shine into our hearts that the night and the darkness of sin and the mists of error on every side being driven away by the brightness of thy shining within our hearts, 
we may all our life walk without stumbling as in the daytime and being pure and clean from the works of darkness may abound in all good works which thou hast prepared for us to walk in. Amen. That's a pretty good prayer, isn't it? That's a pretty good prayer. We quote a little scripture, of course. We say, now, Lord, wash us. We need fresh cleansing. Lord, we confess our sins. We, re we repent of our sins. Wash us clean again. May the washing of the water of the word function. And, oh, Lord, get us under the blood. He didn't do that. He was too liturgical. I'll get that later. But... Uh, that's Erasmus, you see. Now, when you stomp your feet all over Erasmus, and some of these people criticize him, and they say, well, that, that Greek text that you've got in your New Testament standing behind the King James Bible, the way that's the work of a heretic. Yeah, well, he didn't join Luther. In fact, in one place he said, uh, that, well, it has been said that... Uh, that uh, Erasmus laid the egg and Luther hatched it. And then he didn't join Luther. And he wrote to Luther, or Luther pled with him to come and join him, and he wrote to Luther and he said, well, he'd like to do that, but he says, you know, your crowd's really not any better than your crowd. He looked upon it as a political division. Well, uh, <laughs> what do you think? And then there's uh, one thing that he writes here that I, I wish it weren't true, but I, I'm afraid that he, he wouldn't have written it if it hadn't been true. And this is a quote from one of his where he's, he's criticizing Romanism. And he says, The huge mass of monasteries where the practice of piety has so declined that by comparison brothels are more temperate and modest. That's Erasmus. He was going to call sin, sin, you see, because he thought that's what it was. Maybe I have time for one other subject. And that one other subject is I, I have uh, been blessed to find and come across this book, which uh, Dr. Waite does not even know about. Well, he knows about it now, because, but he hasn't seen it. Uh, I thank God that here is evidence. Here's a man, I don't know for sure what he belongs to, but he is probably, uh, he's probably, his theology is reformed, and uh, he is a missionary, or has been a missionary, under a work to Muslims, and he writes this whole book, not a very big book, but uh, uh, 60, 75 pages, he writes the whole thing in complaint because he says out on the mission fields where they're trying to lead people to Christ, and he works in the hardest people in the world other than maybe the Navajo Indians, and that's the Muslim. He's the hardest man to win to Christ other than maybe a Navajo Indian. And uh, he works with them. Now he's complaining that the methodology that has been adopted to translate the scripture is not translating the scripture. And there are faults and flaws. And so I have a little analysis of the book and I, I put it on my card system. The first thing is that he attacks, and if uh, the, uh, does that mean something? All right. He attacks contextualization, which is what Dr. Waite has popularized as dynamic equivalency. And he attacks that as the idea of developing in the translator develops in his mind what the scripture is saying to him and that that's what he puts into the other language and puts it into the text yeah but what does it say to me what does it say to you what does it say to you what does it say to somebody else what is the consensus of what it actually says that ought to be on the page 
is one man competent to decide what it means and so write it in there? Well, contextualization. And this gentleman says that that is an egg that has been hatched by the World Council of Churches. And he blames them and makes them at fault for all of that. Then he says theologically the problem lies at the door of Karl Barth. And of course Barth, uh, the neo-orthodox, uh, he is a subjectivist. He's dead now. But he was not interested in what we want in terms of that which is a literal commuting, carrying from one language into the other as the very best possible sense a literal translation of this word and a literal translation of this sentence. Now, Barth wasn't interested in that, so, so he blames Barth and uh, lays that at Barth's door. And then uh, have you heard of the church growth movement? The church growth movement. Now, I like to have churches grow, but I don't like them to grow in size by taking the world in. I like them to grow in size because people get born in the Spirit, washed in the blood, and they go through the waters of baptism, and they unite with the believer, believers in light faith. And they're filled with the Holy Ghost, and that transformation is in process. Well, he blames the church growth movement and the subjectivity of the church growth movement. And I won't read you what's on the card, but I'll put that there to remind me. Have you heard of Eugene Nida, N-I-D-A? Okay, he blames NIDA. And he says that NIDA's relativism on the scriptures is what has developed and popularized dynamic equivalence. The dynamic equivalence is you're supposed to be able to come to consciousness in your concept of the moving message of a given word or a given sentence and that's what you write down on the page and you don't care whether it's a word for word translation of what the original says that doesn't matter you are to put down what is the genuine idea or commute that which is the thought of it and that he blames on Nida and he says Nida is responsible for that and so it has brought relativism in the scripture we no longer have an absolute in an actual literal translation but we have relativism now we need to admit of course and that's why we talk about this problem of inspiration we need to admit that in some languages there just aren't words to take care of what needs to be translated so uh we have to work on that. We have to work on that. And uh, then he blames the ethnology on Fuller Seminary and Charles Kraft, K-R-A-F-T, as the man who is at fault. If you remember any of these names and these men and these institutions and these movements, you look out for them because if they endorse it, it's probably something that's going to get people in a lot of trouble unless, I shouldn't say going to, it already has got a lot of people into a lot of trouble.